My name is Matt Miller. Uh, I'm a professor at Loyola, and I am the creator of Spoken Project. And I'm really glad that you are joining us this evening. As people are logging in, we're going to ask um, uh, the members of the Spoken team to introduce themselves. I'll start. Um, and I'll just say that uh, several, several years ago, I got a camera and an idea, and I started asking people on camera about their racism experiences. And with the work of the, with uh, the, the input of people on this call and the spoken team um, really helped me kind of create this vision for uh, a way of um, sharing our stories in a very meaningful way. And that's what Spoken Project is about. It's a way to share our stories, to uh, be heard, be seen, to support one another, um, and really believing that storytelling is a way to heal. You know, years ago, I thought storytelling was the way to get helpful messages out. And I believe that happens, but I also believe that storytelling is, is a way to heal as well. And so that's what we're gonna do tonight. And if uh, the, the Loyola spoken uh, group can kind of just give their intros real quick. Tiffany, you wanna start us off? Hi everyone, I'm Tiffany. I'm a doctoral student. I'm at Loyola and I've been working on the spoken project for this last year. Hi, I'm Jeannie, pronoun she, her. I'm also a counseling psychology doctoral student at Loyola. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Erica. I am a second year in the um, counseling psych doctoral program at Loyola, um, and I've been helping out with this project for the last year. Hi, everyone. My name is Hanali, and I'm also a second year doctoral student. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to be here today. Hi, my name is Kay, um, and I'm a first year master's student with TEAM. And uh, I now would like to introduce another group of people, which are uh, former current students at the University of Maryland that really were with me at the start of this uh, project and really were instrumental in creating a lot of the content that exists on the YouTube page. Uh, Yoon, would you mind starting us off? Not at all. Hi, everybody. My name is Yoon. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I was a former, former advisee of Matt when he started using his camera and following people around. Um, and that was a very uh, significant part of my doctoral experience. Uh, I'm now joining all of you from uh, another continent. I'm back in my home country in China and I'm currently a researcher at Zhejiang University. And congratulations on that appointment. I still remember, I think very on in, in, in Yoon's training, she was helping me with a video and she's holding like this reflector that you use in like camera in like uh photography and videography and i just remember thinking like i'm sorry you i i know this is kind of a ridiculous thing but but you were such a big part of this work so uh nancy hi everyone my name is nancy i use she her pronouns and i was one of matt's former advisees um back uh back in 2019 i graduated from university of maryland and i just remember matt convincing us all as a lab to go on these trips on the weekends to record people. And we're like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. But um, I think it's just been such an exciting project to see it come into fruition and actually see the videos have been so impactful. And just that healing piece that Matt really talks about it just, um, we've shared some of the videos that he's created um, within our program at ASU. Um, so currently I'm a clinical assistant professor at um, ASU's counseling psychology program. And it's just been so impactful. And so just really appreciative of this project and um, the people who share their stories as part of this project. And Lydia. Hi everyone, great to see everyone. Um, my name is Lydia, I'm currently a fifth year PhD candidate in um, counseling psychology at the University of Maryland. I have been working with Matt since 2016 and he was slash is my current advisor until he left us. Well, thank you, everyone. And I, I was trying to unmute myself to laugh at that, Lydia. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself soon enough. Um, well, it's it's my uh, real privilege and honor to introduce our, our featured storyteller tonight. Um, uh, Milo's was one of the first videos that I put together in, in uh, years ago. I think, what, four, four years ago we interviewed you? Um, 
but 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 I, I met Milo um, when Milo was a sophomore or junior at the University of Notre Dame. I taught a cross cultural psychology course, which I'm sure was terrible. And it's been a real privilege to see over the years to see you uh, really have an impact on the field and in in ways that many of us in the field are simply unable to do given your skill set. So I want to read Milo, uh, Dr. Milo L. Dodson has done quite a bit in a short period of time. Um, someone who I believe really lives out the idea of an advocate uh, and service-based leader. Um, he is currently Senior Manager of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Outreach for Belkin International. And if you, if you need to Google that, my guess is all of you have a Belkin product in your house. So this is a major, major uh, uh, institution and business. And so it's really, I feel really um, good about uh, the fact that you are there as a someone who is making a mark in terms of diversity. That's excellent. Um, uh, Dr. Dodson's uh, a counseling psychologist um, and has trained with some of the biggest names we know in our field. Um, for years, he has engaged uh, in uh, service such as directing the hip hop artist Commons Dreamers and Believers Summer Youth Camp for over six years. Uh, he has volunteered for Colin Kaepernick's Know Your Rights Camp and Kenny Still's Still Growing Summit. Um, he has contributed an original essay to April Ryan's book at Mama's Knee, Mothers and Race in Black and White. Um, Dr. Dodson also co-hosts a podcast uh, uh, with uh, uh, acclaimed radio personality Yezi Ortez called Mental Health is Real, uh, reflecting empathy and love, where he discusses wellness, mental health, and social justice. Uh, if you don't already follow uh, Dr. Milo L. Dodson on Twitter, uh, I don't know if people no longer use Twitter or not. I'm kind of new to it, but I hear it's kind of going out. I don't know. Uh, I'm not on TikTok, but uh, PH Dodson on Twitter and Instagram are where you can find him. So, um, so with that being said, so thank you very much for joining us, everyone. And and Milo, now if we can turn our attention to you, uh, you know, we met years ago. You have. Uh, a very powerful and moving video up. And if, if people have, I, I will take this off the screen in a second, um, but if people haven't uh, seen Milo's video, uh, Milo is gonna share a story in a second, but I would really encourage you to go to the YouTube. You can go just search on YouTube Spoken Project and pull up and watch uh, at a later time um, uh, Milo's video. And when I shared that on my social media, very small social media platform, I had a lot of people reach out and really talk about uh, how um, relevant and how moved they were with the story that they either related with it directly or um, were hearing about it in a way that was really um, inspiring to them. So, so Milo, if I can ask you um, to uh, share the story that you uh, shared with us about being uh, stopped and essentially assaulted by police uh, riding your bike home from the movie theater with your mother. Yeah, sure thing. So <clears throat> um, definitely going to share and I just really want to open up by sharing uh, gratitude uh, for everyone in this space tonight. Um, and also a special shout out to Matt. Matt is probably one of the most um, humble and modest people I know when it comes into these spaces. So lots of love and, and props to you, Matt, for being able to do this work and work on this project, not just with me, but all the other amazing stories and, and um, journeys of, of folks. So, so my story um, <clears throat> was when I was 15 years old. Um, I was riding my bike home with my mom from the movies. Uh, mom's never had a driver's license. And since I was a little kid riding my bike all over the city with a, like no joke, a purple shark helmet on. Um, so where she's, get, she's getting off work late and we go to see the movie Ali and uh, we get out probably midnight, one o'clock. So it's relatively late and just trying to make our way home, get home safe and all that. And um, I see a police officer pull up kind of on the opposite side of the road. And sure enough, as soon as he gets to an intersection, he does a quick U-turn and pulls up on us really, really fast. And says, you know, both of you on the side of the road, um, you know, get off your bikes, put your hands down over here, da da da. And so I'm, you know, following everything he's saying to, to the letter. And, 
you know, soon enough we get to talking and no joke, this guy actually starts to flirt with my mom right in front of me and asking her questions like when's the next time she's going to the movies, what the latest movie she saw, et cetera. And I'm thinking like, all right, this is super awkward at this point, but at least I'm gonna be able to get home relatively quick. No sooner than he's done flirting with my mom in front of me, uh, another officer pulls up and it's the epitome of good cop, bad cop, if we want to buy into the belief that there are good cops that way. And there is uh, a sudden shift in the mood, energy completely different. <clears throat> and the second officer, kind of ignores my mom um, and goes right to me. Now for context here, what's important to point out is that my mom is Italian American, so she, she's white. And phenotypically, I'm black, you wouldn't be able to tell that I'm biracial. Um, so he comes immediately to me, what I perceived as him profiling me as a, a young black boy. <clears throat> and completely ignores the other officer, comes directly to me and starts to be able to verbally harass me at first. And again, I'm just trying to comply because that's what I've learned since I was a little boy. That's a message that we still hear on the news today. Just comply, you'll be okay. So I'm complying. And the question that he asked me that kind of shifted things really quick was, um, do you have any ID on you? And I'm like, sure, like, you know, I'm thinking I'm an AP student. I'll just pull out my ID with my little honor sticker on it, da, da, da. So I go on my pocket really quick, not thinking that no sudden movements is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I go on my pocket as asked. And he says, wait, 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 before you do that, do you have any guns, knives, or drug paraphernalia or bazookas in your pocket? And I'm just like, really, dude, like a bazooka? So given my ID, kind of just tosses it to the side and again, completely ignoring my mom who's shaken up at this point herself. And he, he kind of like physically kind of pushes me to the side, makes me put my hands up on a light post and basically assaults me at this point. And he's touching me in all the wrong places. He is kind of giving me a, a extra, extra pat down to make sure I don't have any of those items on me. And again, I'm just a, a 15 year old boy in, in America trying to get home from the movies with his mom. And every time I, I tell the story, it still feels really emotional. Um, and for some folks who may have seen Matt's amazing work online, the, the key thing for me here was just asking why, and why did this have, have to happen? If this was about justice, then he would have searched my mom too, but it wasn't about justice. It was about racial profiling a young black boy who in that instance didn't have a chance to be a child. And so I'm, I'm treated as, as an adult in that case. And so again, I asked why, and I, I just wanted I just wanted my humanity to be able to be acknowledged. I wanted my humanity to be able to be validated, to be able to just get home safely with my mom. Now, now keep in mind, um, the last thing I'll, I'll say here as I'm sharing this story is that later in, maybe two years later, there was like a white supremacy outbreak at my high school with kids wearing Confederate flag hats there was um, another incident that I don't think I'll have time to get into right now, but I can share later. There was another incident where um, I, I was almost beat to death uh, a couple years later and, and was threatened. So in, in the city, there was this wake up call that I wasn't going to be allowed to live out the rest of, of my childhood. I didn't feel like in that case, I was gonna be able to survive. And at the very least, I didn't feel like I could be a child anymore because I'm <clears throat> fighting for my life and, and not even getting justice. So um, that that's the the story piece of it. Um, and and again, it just makes me so incredibly emotional on on every single time that I talk about this because I can still feel, and, and we know as a lot of us are mental health professionals here, a lot of us know that feeling of, of compounded trauma, yeah? So when I see 
um, countless black boys, uh, black bodies, brown bodies being brutalized by police in the search of quote unquote justice when we get trials that are supposed to give justice but are really more about accountability um that trauma continues to to resurface and um i'm at a place where i've kind of got to acceptance in a sense in terms of grieving that that childhood in terms of grieving what i thought was going to be this justice system um and continuing to to fight for justice and and defunding police uh potentially working towards abolishing the police um because it's not it's not justice this is not a system that even allows a 15 year old boy to ride his bike home safely with with his mom thank you for sharing that uh, you know, I'm, I'm struck with um, a lot of, uh, I didn't hear some of those, those other stories, uh, or, or no greater detail, but I'm, you know, wondering, like, what is, when you see the news today, when you see every day, there's another um, black or brown kid, adult being assaulted, murdered, you know, and knowing that you have there that that was your experience at 15 too. I mean, what what is that like seeing this happening now and having this this kind of experience? Like, what is it like to turn on the news and see that now? Um, it's it's re traumatizing. I mean, I think I I see so much of myself in Tamir Rice, I see so much of myself in Trayvon Martin, I see so much of myself in all of these kids who were not able to, to be kids. Um, and even in as adults, um, being, you know, verbally harassed by police. Um, a lot of us know that when we're doing, um, at least in the state of California, when we're doing 5150s, having to work with police, there's still that, that triggering where I, I feel myself getting tense. And I'm, I'm like, at that point, I'm the doctor that they're trying to consult with, right? So there's still that piece. And even when I'm turning on the news, I have to be really, really intentional about when and how I'm on social media and, and consuming news. Because if I'm not centered, if I'm not grounded, I'm going to uh, not be able to focus on my clinical work, not being able to focus on, you know, work these days at Belkin is a little different, but it's to answer your question, Matt, directly, it's, it's re-traumatizing and triggering. And I think I really have to ground myself in, um, you know, some of the, the tools that I've learned in therapy, uh, some of the strategies that I've learned along the way, because it's, it's not that being black is, is exhausting. I want to be very, very clear. Being black is a beautiful thing. So it's not being black that's exhausting. It's white supremacy that's exhausting. And I think being able to frame it that way and to, to name it that way is essential because a lot, we're, we're tired. And, and I definitely feel tired when I see more of that coverage. Yeah, I, I, it's still like I can't understand how like when I'm on social media, I see people like posting like their meal or their dog, which is fine. But if they're not also like, I, I just don't understand that experience where people, they, the, you know, they can simply not occupy that. That's never something they think about. Um, and then, you know, I know people in my own life who are also trying to get me to stop talking. About, don't worry about that stuff. That's not you know, that, that they can kind of compartmentalize or remove or be removed from it is just something that that is, um, you know, as you're describing the re-traumatization process to, to know that there are people out there who are like, what a great day, you know, what's what a wonderful, this last year has been wonderful. I've been able to do extra work, you know, I'll, I'll be, so um, I, I wanted to just- Yeah, but I wanted to just real quick, I, I do think that it's, it's helpful to name here though that joy is necessary in the midst of that sorrow so like you know in in the midst of everything being able to share i i just got married right so like i'm super geeking out about being able to share 
share wedding photos and like totally talk up my amazing, phenomenally brilliant and strong wife. And I think so with that joy, I, I share that and I prioritize that in my heart to help me better cope with some of that sorrow. And at the same time, though, to your to your point, Matt, I think it's it's a privilege to not have to ever have that consideration of prioritizing that joy. And it's a privilege to never have to think about, you know, social consciousness and social justice applied in that social media lens. So I think it, for me, at least it's a little bit of both. And um, I actually would want to encourage people, look, I, I want to see that picture of the amazing uh, burger that you ate or that ice cream that you're going to devour later. And I also want to invite you to consider to use that platform to really speak truth to power and to talk about things that have killed so many people. I appreciate that perspective. It, it reminds me, I do have a quote that I see a lot from you, which I think is really, uh, I want to ask you, so you, I see a lot in your social media, love and be loved, which I think is just a, a beautiful saying that that philosophy and, and the one that I also really resonate with is, I got you, you got me, we got we, which I feel like is like the heart of what we do at Spoken Project. But can you tell us, like, where did those, where, where did you find those? Or did you create like what and what do they mean to you? Um, to me, there's a theme about they, they spoke, they both speak to the necessity of community in, in healing, and the the power of community in healing. So with um, love and beloved there, <laughs> I, I promise this is a shift, but it, it ties back in. So um, that actually came from a past romantic relationship that didn't work out so great for me. That's a whole nother uh, webcast. But there was this, this part that I was feeling from that was, look, I'm, I'm continuing to love this person and I'm not getting that love back. So it's like something clicked when I was in grad school, when, when this relationship didn't go so great, um, that it's important to love, but it's also necessary to be loved. And then so that just kind of opened up up my my mind to well love is kind of this like reciprocated piece and <clears throat> in terms of giving this communal love that we're talking about today i want to be able to pour into the community and it's also necessary for me to to work through the pain to allow the community to pour back into me and so so similarly the i got you you got me we got we that's a sense of communal healing because like look i'm a, i'm going to go to bat for you um, I'm going to go to bat for you. I'm going to be on the front lines for you. And, um, I know that you're going to do that for me. And, um, the only way that we, um, not just survive, but the only way that we continue to at least some what thrive at moments thrive to to be able to receive that joy that i was talking about earlier the only way we do that is with each other in community together so that's where that's where both of those come from yeah i, I remember years ago seeing that and i think especially now like that's how we get that we we, we need that so desperately that communities need to be supporting and getting each other, you know, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful kind of perspective. I want to let everyone know uh, there. I think that the chat is there and people are putting in there, but we, we have a Padlet if people want to. Uh, we, we will have a more interactive session coming up very soon so that um, you can ask questions directly if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question or if you want to follow up uh, asking uh, Milo a question. It, the Padlet option is at a place where you can raise questions or share your own stories in a way that is anonymous and safe. We ask you to be very um, mindful of, of other people's comments and posts here to be respectful. Um, and, and anyone, please feel free to um, uh, raise questions in, in the chat or, or Padlet. We're monitoring those. And if you want to share verbally, uh, you, there's the raise your hand feature, and we will allow that too. But, but I, I'm curious for the spoken team. Um, you know, one of the things I remember was during Milo's interview, 
there was a moment where I think I, I when, when I was editing your video, there was a point at which you, you, you were struck with profound emotion. And I don't know if it was sadness, grief, or where it, it was minutes. I mean, when I was editing that footage, it was minutes. And I wanted to keep that in there because when I was doing the editing, I was having my own healing just from hearing your story. Like every video I edit is a healing, multiple healing moments for me. And it was powerful. And that's what people resonated with when I shared that video. They, they talked about that moment as like, because there's silence and in, in, in the profound kind of emotion there. And I'm curious, what, what was it like for you? What's it like for you knowing that that story is out there? Anybody can go click on that and see, relive, rewatch that moment, profound moment. You have, What's that? I don't have that out there right now. So like, what is that like having that? Yeah, um, it's... Um it's a level of vulnerability that I, I feel privileged to, to offer. Um, I'll, I'll be very honest. I, I considered all of the, you know, the clinical implications, our client's going to see this, our future employer is going to see this. Um, is my like family and friends going to see this? And, and to me, the answer to all of that is always being able to, to, lean into love and to lean into that vulnerability and i couldn't and this is just this is just me being me here i couldn't ask my clients to continue to dig into that pain without at least talking about my own personal journey because before i was a black man serving as a psychologist i was a black man in america and so for me the authenticity and that truth is so so key i i didn't feel like i could i could keep that in and so similar to your point, Matt, what, what the, the client is, so to speak here, is healing. And the, the healing that's taking place is the community. So when we're talking about sharing narratives, that's what we're doing here. And it was a privilege for me to be that vulnerable um, when I shared with you all a couple of years ago. And it's a privilege for me to be in this space and also being, being tearful. Um, and it's, it's something that I feel personally called to do. And it's, it's necessary for me. Thank you. I'm curious if uh, anyone on the spoken team or, or uh, you and I believe you uh, facilitated that conversation years ago. Yeah, I, I remember the interview and um, I also remember uh, Milo um taking a pause and i was just um i was nodding the screen right and um i understand that what i what i say and do would be added out of the video you know in the final product um but that was a moment where i felt like we were you know sharing that moment um and i remember thinking wow, um, if without the purpose of the video, what, what have I done to earn this vulnerability, earn this moment, earn this trust? Um, and I was just so struck in that moment. Another thing that I remember was you talking about how, you know, we were, uh, we were at APA that, that year, that was why that was why we were able to be physically together. And then we were able to schedule the interview. And that year, APA was in DC. And I remember you talking about how the proximity to DC also gives, you know, doing the work, sharing your experience, another layer of meaning, being so close to the cap cap capital. Um, and yeah, I. I just remember being speechless um, and not knowing what role I should be in, who, 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 who am I in that moment? Um, so I, I, I believe we just sat there for a pretty long period of time. Someday after like a year and a half of Zoom meetings and I still forget to unmute myself, 
very, very nice move. But I love how you phrased it, you sharing a moment, because I feel like that, that like that for me, before we started doing the work, or as we were doing the work, I didn't realize there were these moments of healing that were happening right then, that the idea in my head was that we're going to do this project so that we can help people heal in the future, not realizing that if I to stop paying attention to the camera and start paying attention to what's happening in the room, we are having a moment of healing now. And we've had those. We've done other work on this project. And Tiffany on this call led a focus group. And that focus group was a healing moment. I thought it was going to be a focus group. It was a healing moment. Um, and I think that's, you know, spoken project is storytelling to survive, cope with, um, heal from racism. And we can't do that by ourselves, but it's the, creating these moments and these spaces. But I appreciate so much, Milo, that it happens when we take a risk to share our stories. You know, I, how you mm -hmm. talked about, you thought about the audience, who's going to, who, who might see it, what might that mean? And yet you did that. And because you shared your story with me, with us, you, you let us in that created healing for us in that it was some, you know, not so awesome, like hotel in DC, we, we had a couple cameras crammed into this small space. Um, but it really was like a wonderful moment. Um, and that's really why we're doing these live sessions now, because we want to invite lots of people into that. So whoever's monitoring chat, can somebody tell me if there's sure. something? So there, there aren't any questions. I was just going to pose that to the chat and see if we could get some questions coming in. Um, but I think the overwhelming majority of the comments have just been this really deep appreciation for Milo and being able to be vulnerable, um, both in the project as well as here in the space. Um, and, and it really being, again, like a profound moment that's happening here. I, I, I'm adding that, I think, um, feeling like this is a moment as well. So if folks have questions, please, please pop those in the chat or you can raise your hand. While we're uh, waiting for those, um, Milo, with the, the, you know, when we did the interview, we asked questions about your experiences of race and racism, but we also asked questions about coping. And you gave, and if, you know, if, if those watching haven't seen the video, definitely check it out. Milo gives a very nice whole, what I would describe as a very holistic strategy for, for coping with racism. I'm curious now, because when we did that, there was someone in the uh, presidency who I think we would both say was doing harm. Uh, and years later, we would have both probably at that point never imagined how bad uh, and, and frequent and normalized in some ways things were. So I'm curious in the mm -hmm. last year, if you don't mind sharing, like how have you, I mean, coping has been a real challenge for me. Uh, and I'm curious if there, can you share about what the last year or so of coping uh, has been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, coping is something that, um, you know, is similar to to my joy. And, and what I often say is joy is my freedom. So in the, the continued search of joy, uh, excuse me, the continued search of justice and freedom for our people, it's about prioritizing joy. And that's the freedom that I am able to tap into on a daily basis. And so in the video, I talk about going to the gym as kind of like the physical release of some of that um, physical tension when I'm feeling anxious or sad or depressed. Um, also, I think I may have talked about my love for ice cream. I'm not quite sure if I got to that in the video, but shout out to Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> uh, and also I don't know to, if that made that in Colin the Kaepernick. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, anyways, just to give you all a peek behind the curtain here. Um, love me some ice cream, especially Ben and Jerry's. So, you know, like you're talking about it, it's a holistic approach where you need, um, you know, you need your greens, you need your proteins, but you also need your ice cream. And when we're watching news in terms of coping, you need the substance and you also need the means, right? So, so that's one piece. The other, um, 
the other piece I want to name here, I think this was a combination of Kevin, Dr. Nadal, and Carlton, Dr. Green in, in their own stories that they shared. Um, and essentially the theme about making sure that you're not internalizing the external. So when I'm thinking about navigating as a black man in America, navigating this, this system that let's name it what it is it, as a racist system here. Um, when I'm thinking about how I navigate that system, I can't internalize this external system. And even though I'm seeing it on a daily basis, to not internalize that because as Dr. Green said, that's sick, that's the illness. Me trying to work through that is not the sickness or the illness, that's life. And that's what I need to focus on. So, um, you know, the other things, just being able to, to talk about it. Um, I also really want to normalize rest. Um, being able, something my wife told me to, to put into context here, we rest to resist. And when we can get good sleep, you know, super, super key. Um, the last thing I want to share here as from Black Psychology and uh, Dr. Thomas Parham and Dr. White, rest in peace, um, taught me is that we can't seek validation from our oppressor. So I'm not looking to these external systems to give me this like coping mechanism or this self-care. I'm looking into the, the Black brilliance as inherent to who I am and tapping into that inherent value. Mm -hmm. So essentially what I'm talking about here is more like a, a deeper reflection time um, because that stillness is, is peace. And that's something that is um, unfortunately a, a luxury. So. Oh, when you said we cannot seek validation from the oppressor, I, I had to take a breath. I mean, I feel like for so many years of my adult life, there has been a part of me that has done that and I'm angry about it now. And I feel like the last few years has been me just being angry that that's what I did for so long. And so to hear you name it, it was kind of like, whew, I mean, that, that was, uh, that's deep, man. That's hard that, you know, to, to internalize in, internalizing is so, Oh my gosh, it's struggle is real. I mean, I love the, you know, what Carlton Green says, uh, what Kevin Nadal says was beautiful. And I just really appreciate you sharing that right now. I'm like a little struck with, uh, uh, I feel like I need to go to a, qu a question here because uh, my, um, my, my mental processes are kind of pausing right now. Um, so if I, if you don't mind it, can I, can I ask a question that somebody raised in the chat? Um, what are your, yeah, sure. Sure thing. Before you, before you do that, I just want to thank you for letting us into your process right now, because too often you behind the camera, uh, I'm sure there's lots that you're thinking and feeling. And so for you to be on camera right now and share your process at least means a lot to me. And I'm going to, humbly say that I speak for a lot of us on this call right now is that uh, we thank you for that. No, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, for those who know me being on camera is the last thing and I'm, this is not my skill set. But um, uh, so a question uh, is, what are your self care tips for black scholars who engage race in racial trauma work inside and outside of the classroom as well as uh, a topic for dissertation? Oh, that's that's a hearty question. Okay, let me pull up the chat here because I'm gonna want to see this. Uh, self care tips for black inside and outside of the classroom, as well as a okay. So let's take the first part inside and outside of the classroom. I think um, my approach in in doing the the research that I did about the N word um, and doing a lot of uh, research, you know, at, at Irvine or the clinical work at Irvine, being in that type of institution, um, being intentional about when and how I'm doing that research and to be able to create more structure and, and boundaries, not just in my time management, but emotional boundaries about when I'm choosing to engage in that research. 
And my particular research paradigm, shout out to, to Helen, uh, Dr. Neville, if she's watching, but my particular research paradigm, remembering that I myself am the, the channel for the research and I am the conduit of that research, I then by extension have to take that much more care of myself to make sure I'm grounded in the research question, the principles um, in the research and not, uh, as I've, I've also heard, not leaking into my research project or not leaking into this racial trauma work. So essentially what I'm saying is that we have to prioritize our own joy as we continue to do this never ending work. Um, I wasn't sure if the second part, the topic for dissertation, if that could be, are your self-care tips for black scholars as well as, as a topic for, I, I think honestly, if the, the person here is asking for a potential topic, there's an infinite amount of topics um, that are all necessary and relevant to um, digging into more of this racial trauma work and even in itself being able to study the the self-care tips of black scholars doing this work that would be of, of interest to me so um Okay, I see. I see a bunch of questions now. Um, I'm gonna go back to one, but I'm gonna if, if it's I'm gonna ask one out of turn because I, I would also like to know the answer to this question. Uh, how do we not internalize? Like that is a, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid 40s and I feel like I got a long way to go for this. So please, no pressure. I might not be the only one on this call who wants to know how do we not internalize growing up in the system how can we not internalize and how can we uninternalize or externalize mm. it, it is not easy and it is not something that i do successfully all the time um i would be lying to you if i said i did and i think anybody would be lying to you if they said they did it perfectly all the time w what i i view here is what what it starts with for me i'll just share from my process what it starts with for me was being able to say the pain is damn sure not my fault but healing is my opportunity and so when i'm able to grasp on to the opportunity to heal i'm able to push back and resist the external systems that try to oppress us so when i'm what i'm not doing is also internalizing racist behavior i'm able to say and i think dr nadal speaks to this perfectly and, and dr green as well as being able to name that's racist behavior i'm not deserving of that that's racism that's white supremacy i'm not deserving of that and not just saying i'm not just deserving of that but i am deserving of love and being loved i am deserving of being able to live I am deserving of community and healing. So for me, it's, it's about a harmony, not a, not a balance, but a harmony of pain and healing. Because I think just like we, we don't say work-life balance anymore, especially working from home, like that doesn't even exist. It's more so a harmony, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're able to really kind of have that all intertwined. But again, the internal, milo is different from the external system that milo navigates so the last thing i'll say here is also reminding myself of not just who i am but whose i am and and for me that that's deeply rooted in my spiritual and religious beliefs um i know that's not for everyone but i think again that speaks to just what my what my experience has been uh to not internalize um it's hard, it takes practice. I absolutely suck at it sometimes. And what I'm also getting better at is giving myself more grace and patience. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I invite those of you on the call, is that what these things are called? Is it, this isn't a call. I don't know what other word to use, but uh, for all of us here in the moment, uh, I would invite you to use the Padlet or the chat also like what are ways, you know, part of this time together is also share. So 
for those of you who are on the, the call, what are ways that you try to uh, cope or not externalize racism? Um, please feel free to, sh to add that we will get back we'll go through more of these questions, uh, please, uh, please keep sending them. I think one thing for me that's really been helpful. Uh, one of the I love how you framed it as an opportunity to heal the last like year and a half, one of the I had just had to fill out a survey today about something and I put um what was one of the things that has helped you through the last year and a half and it's been a group of my friends we had uh, some of them were on this call uh richly uh um uh richard shin um uh brandon you carlos santos Derek iwamoto are friends of mine they're also happen to be in the in the field and we regularly have like two three hour zoom calls where we're just kind of emoting and processing and thinking and they're really helping elevate my thinking and helping me realize ways that I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm actually perpetuating uh, the internalization and the oppression. So that's been a really helpful thing. It, it, it's been hard. And, and if you want to talk about sucking, I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at, at, at trying to externalize at times, but I, I certainly would welcome other people who can share their own perspectives. If anybody wants to share, please do. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing in, I'm doing uh, for those on the spoken team, you know, I'm doing such a, uh, a an ungood job right now of following all the chats going on. I apologize. So please feel free to interrupt and let us know things that I'm missing. Um, uh, what, uh, Milo, if we can ask another question, what are some of your visions and dreams for building solidarity amongst black indigenous and people of color? So the, the first part of that you said was what are your what are some of your visions it was and, uh, uh my vision and dreams yeah of building that solidarity the we got we yeah i think it's um creating spaces such as this um it's about being able to share our net our narrative um and it's a it's about also recognizing that our liberation is is a shared liberation. Um, I'm I'm not as what I learned from Dr. Annalise Singh was the quote from Leela Watson, uh, an Aboriginal activist, um, who talks about the importance of shared liberation and how your liberation, Matt, is so closely tied into mine that I wouldn't be really interested if you, Matt, showed up to help me get free. But if you showed up as Matt, recognizing, hey, I need you and you need me, let's get free together. That's what my vision and my dream is. And I think it, it's also about, you know, as, as mental health professionals, we know folks can be tied from various backgrounds if we have a common goal, right? And, and working towards motivating groups that way. So I, I think it's about helping that goal be that liberation and what we need to resist together to push back against together to lovingly call out each other is against white supremacy in all of its various forms, all of its various institutions, both at an easy to see level and kind of a, um, an unseen level, being able to call that out to name it and then fight back together. So that's, those are some of my, my visions and dreams. Um, I also feel like um, I, I just wanna recognize the, the space that we're in today um, as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month um, and recognizing the various initiatives that are going on with that. And as a black man, I want to be able to have that space to listen um, and to also separate, uh, or I'm sorry, celebrate in that separation to celebrate and to amplify those voices. Um, that's also my some of my visions um, and my dreams. Thank you. Um, okay, my, my own uh, self-consciousness is now like really strong and I'm really hoping that I can pass the microphone a little bit here. Uh, there's nothing worse. I'm gonna edit this video later and the last thing I'm gonna wanna even see or hear is myself. Uh, so I would invite uh, people from the spoken team. Uh, do you have any questions or observations you want to share? Or you and I know I can always count on you for a good process comment. Milo, I have a question that I've been uh, thinking about for a long time. 
uh, and hearing you talk and taking you back to that moment in that DC hotel room and thinking about that question again, you know, uh, Matt was talking about moments of healing. Um, you know, I, I was never sure that us sitting together was a moment of healing for you. I was never sure mm. about that. Um, hearing you talk about your pain in and of itself, um, that's painful to watch. So I often wonder how the healing happens in story sharing, both for the storyteller and for the people hearing the story. And what if, what if there's no, no ending to it? What, is, what if we cannot give um, you know, something to tie it up, which I often feel is true. Mm. What I want to be able to, to just say here directly is that very much was a healing moment for me in DC. I think, again, that was 16, 17. So that was like just that the turn of uh, the turn of our democracy into fascism. And I think when I when I reflect on that trip overall for APA, that definitely stands out as such a healing experience. And when I think back about my life, um, that that does feel like such a healing experience. For me, the, the framework that I've used is kind of um, a release for relief. And so when I start to feel the tension building like I did back then, when I start to feel that hurt, um, I look for different outlets to be able to release in a way that's intentional and controlled and allows me to keep the focus on the healing and again as an opportunity and not just the pain because to go to your question that pain can very much feel like it's never ending and that pain can very much feel like it may not be tied up at the end or we may not come to a resolution but um that i feel so i'm just really struck by that that feels like an opportunity to heal because in that in that moment what, what we're doing is providing empathy and not sympathy. What we're doing is saying like, look, I may not be able to end systemic racism on my own as, as Dr. Miller, as, as you and me here, but what I am going to do is to be able to help you through it in as much as a way as I can. And what I am going to do is to prioritize your healing and to at least hold some of that, that hurt with you. So, um, Again, I think it's more so about the process of healing and not having any tied expectation to the outcome, because the process in itself is the healing that we need to prioritize. Thank you for saying that. And I was just um, really touched. Um, and that 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 was what was like for me as the person interviewing you in the moment is I knew there was no way for me to you know go back and be with the 15 year old you um, even if you were a client um, that's not you know that that may be emotionally possible but never really possible. And you were not a client. Um, and in that moment, all, all I remember was you were there, we were there. And um, yeah, that, that was what I took away from that moment myself. So thank you for saying that. No, thank you, Yoon. Uh, I, you know, it, this moment is great for so many reasons. One of them is that it's a little reunion for a lot of us. So it's, it's really wonderful to, to reconnect in this way. I do see um, uh, other spoken project people. I want to follow up with you in a second, but I do see a, a question that Erica forwarded me in the chat. Um, here's a question for you, Milo. Um, uh, the question is, I also work with young people with their traumatized families. What were your discussions like with your mom regarding institutional racism, etc? 
Such a timely question for for this moment. Yeah, yeah. So with my mom, um, I think my mom has instilled in me that theme that you hear me talk about time and time again about love and be loved and the necessity of feeling joy through that that sorrow. Um, I also think I want to be, be direct here and, and name it because I've had these conversations with my mom too. Um, again, my mom as a white woman in America has been able to model to me what it means to really not just be an ally, but to be a co-conspirator in terms of resisting these racist institutions and systemic oppression. And so for me, you know, as a mom, like <clears throat> teaching, I never know, never knew my, my biological father. So it's about teaching that heritage that um, I deserve to know about. And it's about my right to know my history. And it's also about modeling to me what it feels like to know when somebody unconditionally loves you and what it feels like to have somebody unconditionally show up for you knowing their privilege right and so i think as as we think about all parents here being able to show up in a way where we speak twice and listen once because i think a lot of times you know parents caregivers guardians were quick to jump in and we want to be able to love on our, our love young ones and sometimes what i didn't get as much from my mom at in some moments was being able to just speak to express my because she's wanting to guide me in a certain way so those conversations with my mom over the years have been like mom like i love you and also just like let me let me just um try not to use too many colorful words here but let me just like talk right let me just express myself let me just let it out and her being able to value the in that moment the space of her being able to be silent so that she can validate me after and then also not being silent against um, speaking out against systemic racism and the police brutality that uh, she, you know, firsthand witnessed. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, as a when I when you when I first heard your story, um, you know, as a parent, I I I of course thought of my own children and. Um, you know, trying to imagine what it would be like, what would my response be if I were to see, you know, my my children being assaulted by police? And again, you know, I think for given my own racial background and in other, um, you know, aspects of my identity experience, you know, I feel like that that's a hypothetical thing. But you know, so I, I was really struck with this experience of editing and listening to your story of, you know. I might not ever know uh, that experience directly, but how can I still talk with my own children about it in a way that is going to be helpful um, and consciousness raising, you know, uh, I don't know, I just feel like um, there are, you know, we have people on this call who are come from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and I think what was especially relevant about your story is that, you know, we see black and brown people harmed by police regularly now and for some of us that is an abstract reality uh and then others on this call that is that's a concern walking out the door and and i feel like that's something that's um i, I don't know that's just something for me i try to how can i understand better um to to show up for my friends and and, and colleagues that i feel like that that's been a real struggle for me um, what, what would you say to somebody who is maybe doesn't um, have that direct experience or identity, but is wanting to be an ally in a way that is not causing harm? That's what I meant to ask this mm. time, because I feel like what I have sure, seen sure. is people causing harm in their pursuit to be an ally. Uh, and I feel like mm -hmm. I've done that. I feel like I've done that a lot, too. I think when. So I'm going to say kind of in a, a don't do, but then do do. Don't ask black people to educate you about 
the systems of oppression and the systems and the, the historical injustices. So don't do that, but do do show up in a way where you're putting their healing and, or our healing, our pain um, on focus and being able to say like, hey, I, I know I may not even have all the words here. I may not even know what to say, but I wanna be able to show up for you and I wanna be able to help in a way that is helpful for you. And I also know that I'm not gonna make an assumption like, oh, you're black, like you must be in a lot of pain this week. Like, did you see what happened on the news? Like they're killing black people, did you know about that? But yeah, don't, don't again, don't do that. But we're focusing more on being able to listen and show up in a way that you've heard somebody say that like, hey, this is what I need. Or even being able to say like, hey, what, what do you need? What would be helpful in this space right now? I'm here. And to, to almost um, be, be intentional and, and simplified, I guess is a word maybe, but not to let that anxiety or that fear of saying the wrong thing stop you from saying anything. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, and again, for other people who are on the call, if there are uh, questions, I, th I think we're, we're am, I, am I wrong? Are we almost caught up? I see a couple more here. Um, uh, Miles, if I can ask another question from the chat here. Um, this question is about addressing a white therapist. As a mixed woman, I was advised by my white male therapist to stop activism until my mental health work is done. What do I say? Stopping activism is like asking me to stop breathing. In our current mental health crisis, it is not easy to just find a therapist of color or a new one at all. And I, Miles, if you would answer that, and then I'm also going to ask a couple of people on the spoken team for their thoughts. Mm. First of all, wow, um, there's a lot to unpack. And I can take the ethical consideration approach as a, a licensed psychologist. I can take the black person approach. If I had a white therapist, <laughs> that there would be a, a very colorful approach. I'm sure that would just kind of uh, come out for me. Um, what I do want to say here is what what would be important to to keep in focus is activism. There, there's so many different ways and types of activism and they're all needed and necessary. So in that moment, what I would want to do, what I would potentially, if, if I had a client coming to me like this, would be to, I would invite you to consider what type of activism we can do right now or in the next couple of weeks where you're maybe starting to improve some of these concerns and you still feel engaged. And then I would also want to be able to validate that it's okay to put down the phone, it's okay to turn off the news, it's okay to disengage for just a little bit. Because like we've been talking about so far in, in this conversation is that racism is an ongoing struggle and we need everybody on board for to deconstruct and to decolonize and to defeat white supremacy. So I need that person in the struggle with me and I need that person to be able to prioritize rest so that we can keep fighting. And ultimately what I would say here is please rest, but please don't quit. Yeah, the, we have some comments in the chat or uh, suggesting that take the black personal approach. And, you know, the, the idea of the, the, you know, listen, if you're a therapist and you're telling people to, to hold off on that, you know, that's uh don't do that <laughs> that's i i, I can no, see please <laughs> there, there are some phases i can see of, of audience and i basically it, don't be that therapist that that is not good uh so if i can so i'm i'm looking at some of the other spoken team members lydia nancy tiffany i, I, I can see your faces right now on the screen what would your response be to uh, someone says their therapist their their white male therapist told a person of color uh, uh, hold off on that until you get things all, all nice and neat. W what is your response to that? So this is a, a white male therapist talking to a client or to... Yeah, the, the, the question was, I think, from somebody on the call who is a client who identifies as a uh, mixed race woman and her white male therapist said, 
stop activism until your mental health work is done. Because yeah. my first thought was find another therapist. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think that's just such a challenging experience. And I just wonder about the, um, just the work that you can do with a therapist who maybe doesn't value who you are as a person. And I know that I don't want to speak for the person, but if activism is really important as part of your experiences and um, it's important to you, um, I think finding a therapist that respects that, I think is important and finding a way to, um, I think, integrate that piece of who you are and also at the same time, working on some of the mental health concerns that, and goals that you're wanting to work on in therapy. But I think if you're working with someone who's not even val valuing who you are, um, what you're bringing in your experiences, I think um, my first initial thought was, um, unfortunately, I feel like that can be a common experience. It's a challenge to find a therapist in general, and it takes yes. time. And that's also yes. um, a part of the system. But um, I think it's hard if you're working with someone who just, in a way, maybe already has an approach of what they think is best for you. And, and you are the expert of your own experiences and your own lived experiences. And so um, that's my take on it and what I would probably tell the person. Thanks. Yeah. yeah so oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lydia. Go ahead. Yeah. I just noticed like hearing that, like my heart racing and it just makes me like angry. Mm. Like what? Um, I, yeah. And unfortunately, like I've heard similar things, whether it's from clients or other people in my life. And it just makes me so angry because people don't realize how the two are tied. Like my activism and being in these kind of spaces is, is my way of healing and working on my mental health. And so I feel like the two, like they're not separate mm. um, and they can't be separate, like separated. And um, so I'm just having like a lot of gut reactions. Um, yeah, I'm right there with you, Lydia. You know, anger is my go-to response. So when I read that, I'm like, oh no, that is, uh, you know, uh, there's a great comment here from uh, uh, Hector Adames. Uh, Activism is a culturally responsive and racially conscious form of behavior act activation. It heals. I love that. Um, thank you for sharing that. And, and, and that's wonderful. And whoever raised that question, uh, uh, thank you for for raising that question. And I, you know, I, I'm reminded of what, what Milo shared earlier, love and be loved, that kind of similar idea that we all as clients, we all deserve a therapist who sees us and accepts us and meets us where we are and doesn't kind of misunderstand us. Um, oh, now I've lost my place in the comments. And I know there's a question here I am trying to find. Sorry. I do have a question that I've been sitting with and thinking about Milo, you sharing your story again with us um, this evening and um, this piece of storytelling as a way of um, healing and, and it can be very impactful. And I'm just curious to hear a little bit more of what your journey has been in owning your own story and your experiences, because I know that can be a challenging experience. I know for me, if even sharing my experiences and I just remember when you shared your, your experiences and your story, I just, was in such awe of the vulnerability piece that you were able to go to that space and actually own your story and your experiences. And that was very powerful for me, powerful for me and also very healing for me. And I'm just wondering what your experience and your journey has been in owning your own experiences and your own stories and actually sharing that with others. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think for me, the I, I find I find a sense of freedom um, in that vulnerability because and me being able to tell my truth as I see it, as I feel it, as I've experienced it, is me being me. And there's no other feeling that's more, more freeing from that. So I think part of the vulnerability does like, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I definitely am super, super scared uh, at times about it. Uh, I remember during internship, I shared, we had a, um, at UC Irvine, we had a screening of Fruitvale Station and I shared the same kind of a shortened version of the uh, story now um, back then. And I remember, I remember talking to my train director the next day and I was like, oh my God, like, let me finish internship because I was, I was crying on this panel. And at the same time, like what, what she encouraged me to think about is 
first of all, you're not going to fail internship. Second of all, being able to say like how powerful that is for the community to see us in that type of way and to know to kind of like almost humanize the therapist that they can be interacting with and to humanize the professional that way. And it was a healing experience for the community because again, me sharing my experience as a first gen student with a lot of first gen students in, in an um, auditorium, um, it, was, it was healing. And so I think it's a, uh, you know, at, at some times being a black man, sharing vulnerabilities feels uh, risky um, but for me, it, it's more of like, um, I don't want to, I don't want to say investment and sound cheesy, but it, it's a way of kind of like community building and, and healing. And I'm willing in a sense to have that as a risk because I know how much of a reward comes with that, that risk. Mm. What a great question, Nancy. Thank you. I, I do have another question here. Um, are there ever times you get tired of fighting? I find myself stuck in trying to fight every hour or finding something to feel the need to fight about every day. Sometimes racism, sexism, white supremacy in common language, uh, et cetera. What do you do? Do you get tired and what do you do? Look, I, I know I'm long winded, so I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to I'm going to add on to that by being able to say, what I do is because, because it's so exhausting, it's like mandatory and required for me to, to rest. And so, like I mentioned earlier about, you know, please rest, but please don't quit. Um, the, the, the trajectory and the scope of justice is, is never ending. Um, when it's so ingrained in the country um, and, and in the world. Uh, so, so I think for me, I, I definitely do feel exhausted at times fighting. I definitely do feel like I just want to throw in the towel and like not care in, in a sense. Um, but, but I can't because that would be neglecting the healing that needs to be done both internally and, and for our community. Um, and so like you, you rest when you need to rest. You call out when you need to call out you dig in when you need to dig in and you also as we've been talking about make sure that you're doing that in community because that makes for um, a lighter lift when there's many hands it makes for easy work or e i should say to be more specific easier work it's never easy but at least it can be easier what would you say to people who are on the call right now who would love to have that source of support and maybe are at a place i see a comment here to exist and persist in a primarily white institution feels like a battle every day so what, what what would you say to the people who don't have these networks or either close or even on zoom like what what would be a, a step to to kind of find that to be able to have a sense of community um <clears throat> in both the the immediate sense um, in your like physical proximity, but also being able to branch out. Um, I've, I think I saw a comment from from somebody earlier and, and uh, Dr. Damas, especially, um, you know, being a part of Dr. White's freedom train mm -hmm. and that freedom train spans states, countries, continents, um, generations. So making sure that we know that we're not just fighting that battle in that particular space and kind of like a one-on-one -on -one or just that space, but knowing that I have an entire army behind me ready to, to battle. And I think when I've been like, you know, uh, blasted by Fox News five, six years ago for, for providing a healing circle at UC Irvine, believe it or not, um, I remember being encouraged by people by saying like, look, this isn't what was supposed to happen. I'm sorry that it happened and you have an entire army with you to, to fight and continue to resist because it is a never ending battle. And sometimes I do need to like lay down and other people are gonna be able to carry the mantle to fight. And when others are gonna lay down or need to take that rest, I'm gonna take up that load for them. Um, so kind of that armor 
of love of radical healing and resistance. Mm. I love that idea of the, there's, there's a connection to history. Uh, the idea of the, you know, that, I mean, the, the last year for me has been, oh, I, I'm not the person to lead this. I, I need to be, I need to learn. I mean, that, that for me has been like, when you talk about the, like the ebb and flow of like, there's a time when I need to do the work and there are time I need to rest for me. The last year has been like, oh, I need to like, just kind of start over again from what I think doing this work is um, related to the internalization piece we talked about before. And, and, you know, I've had to like disentangle all kinds of like nonsense about in my head, you know, growing up here. So for me, I, you know, if there are other people on the call here that have had that process or you're in that process, like you can reach out to me because that's been like the last 12 months of, of realizing oh, all the things I've, I've realized that I have figured out, those are all gone. There used to be a huge stack of things that I thought I understood well. And now, so for me, it's like, I feel like I want to do what you're saying in terms of doing that work, but I also feel like it's just not your time, Matt. So even doing this right now feels very, I have such a high level of anxiety because I want to do this in at the same hand, same time. I'm like, uh, are you even ready or prepared? How do you kind of make sense of that messaging or, or those kind of, of doubts in doing this work? Mm. Well, the way that I make sense of it is actually how, what I'm witnessing you being able to do tonight. And, you know, you can name, <clears throat> you've named the anxiety and some of the fears and you're still here. And you know, from maybe on a cognitive level, but also on an emotional level that this is necessary and important work. So it's in that moment, what I would encourage people to think about is it's not about that person. In your case, Matt, it's not about you. It's about not just me as Milo, but whoever would be in my, my chair tonight. It's about the community that's gonna be watching this live and, and on, on recording. Um, so, what I what I need from from others here, um, my need is to prioritize black life mm. in front of temporary discomfort, or more specifically, not saying this to Matt, but in a lot of cases, um, in, in the numerical majority, white discomfort. Mm. So again, prioritizing black lives in front of white discomfort. Because when we can prioritize black life, that's pushing back against that white supremacy. When we're silent, that's upholding white supremacy. Even if it makes you uncomfortable, you know what the, the opportunity here is. And if we've already bought into this as an opportunity, then I, my humble ask would be to still show up, to be fearful, anxious, et cetera, and to do it anyway. Uh, well, I, I am looking at the time and what I want to say, it's just one last question for you, which is what, what was this like, Milo? I know I appreciate you did this. I sent this email I'm like, Hey, you know, without really knowing what this was going to be, I'm like, Hey, Milo, you want to do this? And I appreciate you, you showed up, but I'm curious, like, what is this like kind of digging into your story more and, and kind of being, uh, I don't know, what, what, what has this been like for you for the last hour and a half? Oh, it's been, it's been healing. Um, it's been rewarding. It's felt scary. It's felt a little bit re-triggering, but more so because I've had prep <clears throat> and I had the time prior to today um, and even earlier today to still my, myself. Um, it hasn't felt as, as triggering or re-traumatizing. Um, so it's been, it's been all those things. And, and I also feel the the privilege of being able to have the voice to, to be in community and to share my story because I know a lot of people don't, millions of black and brown folks don't. Mm. Um, and it feels like that vulnerability, like you know, we're talking about as a risk, it's also a privilege to be vulnerable because I know a lot of maybe grad students watching this are saying like, I couldn't do that. A lot of um, other folks in various positions are maybe feeling like I couldn't do that given X, Y, and Z. 
So I, I own that as a privilege and I'm, I'm grateful for that to, um, to speak truth about my experience. Um, yeah, I just, I just feel really humbled and, and grateful to be in community with people. Every time I have a conversation with you, like there's this moment and the privilege of sharing our stories. And I'm thinking about all the kids that can't and the, the parents that don't, you know, so thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, every, every ur urge wants me to just uh, shut these feelings down. Um, but and I will probably come on, man. You know, I'm like, no, 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 no. You're not doing that, bro. <laughs> ah. Both, both, both. Listen, you just heard me say my, my experience and, uh, both as a psychologist and your brother in the struggle, nah, your, your, your tears honor me. And I, I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's, it's powerful. I, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate your, what you're giving right now. So uh thank you everyone for joining us uh if it's not a surprise this is the first time i've ever done something like this so i, I i've got a lot I, even though i've listened to countless hours of npr doing this is is uh, uh quite a stretch so dr milo dots and i cannot thank you enough for your time now back then and for the amazing work you're doing in the world and for the love that you're putting out into the universe i feel it right now i mean i i feel a lot of things right now but i feel it and i i, I personally have benefited from you sharing your story I, you know i want you to know that editing your story for hours was healing for me and and being here i have so much gratitude and i look forward to future maybe after tonight you're never going to return my emails but if you do i look forward to future collaborations with you okay e emails will always be returned uh, I can't guarantee a time frame, but they will always be returned. Um, that that communal love that we're talking about here is is um, is never ending for you, um, as well as everyone on the the spoken project team. Just so much so much gratitude for um, creating a space. Um, seeing that the chat fill up here, I open it up myself right now. And uh, man, just thank you, thank you, thank you, and lots of love. Thanks, everyone. Please uh, give uh, your love to Dr. Milo L. Dodson. Thank you. And I hope everybody can, you know, for anybody who needs to take a little time tonight to kind of decompress, I'm going to take a breath and go eat a large amount of food as a way to kind of decompress. Thank you for joining us and have a great night. Mm -hmm.